Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hugo Nuts, where we review and discuss with you the greatest sci fi novels of all time. This week, we have Providence by Max Berry, and Brent is going to tell you what it's all about. For sure. Okay. Providence is 320 pages, 10 hours on audiobook, nice and short, uh, and it was published in 2020. We follow four soldiers who are serving a four year tour of duty on a uh, is the only crew members on a giant, super advanced, star-faring battleship that has been sent out to fight the Salamanders, these aliens who have been killing humans and we think, but are we sure, are the bad guys. The ship, though, is controlled by a, an AI. And as the time goes on, our heroes feel less and less like heroes and more and more like they might just be passengers along for the ride. We'll have to find out. Uh, so yeah, that's the scoop. We sure will. <laughs> and uh, this week we are joined by Lori from the Hugo Girl podcast. Thanks for joining us, Lori. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for saying Hugo Girl with such flair. We appreciate that. <laughs> well, yeah, I remember you telling me we, we met you all at uh, Worldcon 2022. And um, I asked how it was pronounced. And that's how you all told me. You wanted it pronounced, so. You've obviously been practicing. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I am one of the co-hosts of the podcast, Hugo Girl. Uh, we read um, Hugo Award-winning science fiction and fantasy novels, and we review them. Um, we are a monthly podcast, and um, I am one of three co-hosts. I'm joined by my friends Haley and Amy, and my husband Kevin does all of our editing and our audio. Um, we were finalists for the Hugo Award for Best Fan Cast last year, and so yes, you were. It was in that capacity that we got to meet you guys and um, do a little interview on your extremely fun red carpet. Um, so yeah. yeah, that was a great experience, and. I'm excited to join y'all today. Yeah, we're excited to you're here too. Your show is like really fun. You guys are are funnier than than we are. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's good to have you. Yes, yes. Um, and don't forget, audience. Now, uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, download, follow us, so you don't miss our next episode, which will be on Brave New World as we slowly tackle the dystopian classics of the past and present. Um, over this year, 2023. Um, but for now, Providence, let's get into it. What did you all think? Lori, why don't you give us your rating and review first? Okay, so I would give this one, I think, three out of five stars. Um, it was an easy read, a quick read, and it was fun in a lot of ways. Um, I am a big fan of when books are not way too long, and this one is not way too long. I think it's always better for a book to leave you wanting a little bit more, which with this book I, I did want a little bit more, rather than wishing that there had not been so much of it. So I appreciate that about it. Um, I think in particular, the author is really good at setting. That's something that I often have a difficult time imagining. And in this book, I felt like I was really right there. Um, I had a very concrete sense of place. There were also parts where I felt like the book was walking up to something that felt really innovative and interesting, but then kind of dropped the threads on those. So um, overall, I was a little bit disappointed by it, but I still thought it was a decent read and a fun read. Um, so that's why I would give it three stars. It's not something that I would tell people steer clear of, but it's also not my favorite thing that I've read recently. Fair and just. Brent, how about you? Uh, I will also give it three stars. Um, there were some cool themes, uh, but they were mostly established early in the book, and I sort of was like waiting for the twist or felt like something else was going to happen, and that did not happen. Uh, so it didn't kind of feel like there were a lot of surprises at the end. It felt <laughs> like like the fun sort of themes and stuff that was happening all happened in, in the beginning. So anyway, yeah, three stars for me. I gave it four. I enjoyed the ride. I thought it was a fun, a fun book that had a different flavor for modern science fiction, and and that the action was pretty straightforward, um, and were centered around a uh, small cast of characters. Um, it felt like a cool um, modern take on the uh, the space war novel, a la Starship Troopers or the Forever War. Um, so that's my take. Um, let's get into the plot. I think one of the the most interesting things about this story is that on both ends, at the the beginning and the end, we have um, these second person plural chapters. You are seeing blank. You are seeing the salamander, the alien, shoot its weapon. You are seeing the ship go down. You are seeing 
X, Y, Z. Um, and I, I, I think it was a cool way of, of, of placing um, the reader as a human on this planet in this universe uh, kind of directly and right away um, and seeing what, what the viewership experience of the story of humanity was all about. Yeah, I like that a lot too. Yeah, I felt like that was the we the reader were supposed to experience at the at that very beginning and very end what like the everyone else in humanity was experiencing about this this situation um it's it's like that that those are the parts that that everyone saw and so what did what did they take away anyway yeah so i like that framing device too Right. And it has those, those constant, like a lot of it's about these constant social media feeds coming from our main characters, um, piping back to the planet, telling, telling the rest of the earth, what, what their, uh, conquest of the aliens, um, is like, and that feels very modern. They have to kind of perform as characters, um, back to the, the humans at home and then they have their private lives as well. Uh, so that social media aspect was, um, you know, hit home as the modern reader. And Lori, you were taught, you hinted at it in your review, but um, you you really liked the setting more than the plot. Yeah, I, like. as a reader, I oftentimes have a difficult time visualizing things, um, particularly locations usually in my head are all just kind of like boxes. Um, and I think that something <laughs> that Barry did really well in this was um, make me feel what it was like to be there. Um, and so in the, prologue it's kind of kind of a prologue the first chapter is sort of separate from the main narrative and that's the part that's um in second person and so that part is really effective because it's like um you're you're watching a recording of something that happened but you're in it and so i think that he did a really good job of using the second person and the description of being on the ship and what's going on and really making you feel like you're there which would be what's happening in the book too that's part of the propaganda of what's going on is putting the you know i guess the general population in this situation. So instead of watching it on a screen, you're sitting in it. And so I think that was really well done. And then in the parts that are in the ship, um, the ship is described as being three miles long, but inside still very cramped and close. And the crew are always bumping into things. And that was kind of on purpose to make the ship not seem too luxurious to the viewers at home. And I could just really feel that. And to be able to have the sense of the scope of the ship, but also that cramped closeness, you know, I mean, everybody knows what it's like to, you know, smack your shoulder into something or bump into a countertop or a cabinet. And I think that um, the way he described that, (laughs) I think the way he described that, I really put me there. So I had a sense of that claustrophobia and I think that was really well done. And then there are some um, additional things that we'll probably talk about in the post spoiler section that I thought were really vivid as well. And I was really um, very well able to imagine. Yeah. And inhabiting, inhabiting that spaceship, we really just have the four characters, right? Yeah. So our four human characters are Gilly, Beanfield, Anders, and Jackson. And it is clear that Gilly and Beanfield are the um, main characters. I'm not sure if protagonist is really the right word for them, but they are the ones that get the most time on the page. Um, about half the book is devoted to them individually. And then the other two characters, Anders and Jackson, each get a couple of um, viewpoint chapters themselves. Um, so a lot less than Gilly and Beanfield. So Gilly works for Surplex, which is the corporation that actually built the warship that they're on. And his job is to monitor the ship's system functions. He's described as Intel is kind of the name of his role. And I guess he's just keeping tabs on the ship's systems in general. Um, The next character, primary character is Beanfield, and her role is called Life. And she... um, Her job that everyone is aware of is that she monitors the ship's life support systems, Um, but her kind of secret role is that she's actually supposed to be catering to the mental health of the crew, and she is not very good at it. And that's not a criticism of just her. (laughs) None of these folks are are particularly (laughs) good at what they're supposed to do. Um, what what their um, nominal jobs are. They're not particularly good at them. Um, Anders is our third character, human character. He monitors the wep- the weapon systems on the ship during in- engagement, so it, during active battle with the salamanders. And he's often absent as he becomes more and more depressed. Uh, he is a kind of a, a gun nut, I guess would be an easy way to describe him, and a uh, um, pretty, uh, pretty outspoken misogynist in some ways. 
It's, it's also important that he's hot. We're told many times how hot he is. <laughs> he it's is an important part of his character. Very good looking. It's part of his job description as we come to find out. Doesn't actually take that long for us to find out that part of his job description is being hot and part of Beanfields is being beautiful and good at, you know, whatever is their equivalent of TikTok. And then our last right. character <laughs> is Jackson. She is the ship's captain. And when I was thinking about what's a good one sentence description of what everyone does. I don't know what she does. She just is the captain. I, no, she's just like mad, but has no chooses. She's like an extremely ineffective captain. Yeah. Her ship is incredibly shoddily run. <laughs> she's just like a be in charge. I'm, I just, I am in charge. Um, she's the, yeah, she's like the military head of operations. And she misses her husband. So those are our, our human characters. And then we've got um, the ship and there is some question about whether or not it may be sentient. Beanfield seems to think it is. And um, yeah, uh, Brent, did you want to add your thoughts on the characters themselves, the human characters? Yeah, they all are extremely dramatic. Uh, <laughs> they just, they're <laughs> constantly like being so upset and like, Everyone's got an opinion about like small things. It kind of felt like, and this is going to sound like a criticism, but I think this is what it was intended to be, but it feels like they're all like on a reality TV show. And so they're all just like on camera telling us their little thing that they're annoyed about that week and they all have beef with each other. But then, but I think that was actually the intention, right? Because these are all supposed to be like social media heroes for people on earth to empathize with and like connect right. with the war. So that's why they're chosen is because they're dramatic. Yes, but so I'll say that that I don't think it was like Max Barry was like failing at making characters. I think they did what he wanted them to do. I just did not like them. I didn't like having to read about them all the time because they're super annoying. Um, I liked them. Okay. Good. Just fine. <laughs> yeah. I liked Gilly. Okay. And I actually thought Gilly was more insightful about his um, shipmates than Beanfield was. Yeah. That was one of the funny, like That's little true. ironies, yeah. wasn't it? That he was he was better uh, at the psychology than the psychologist. And he's supposed to be the almost the the trope of the guy who's like so smart that he doesn't connect with people. And that's really not the case at all. He seems to have much better insight into what Anders needs, why Anders is coming unraveled. Um, he picks up on when Beanfield is really upset about things but then in her head she runs these scenarios where no one realizes how upset she is and he's right there asking her if she's okay and she's like all i had to do is say no and he believed me and it's like well people are allowed to believe you <laughs> Did he? Right. well and and um and yeah and he's they, they kind of flip right because she's actually more in touch with the ship than he is um, oh yeah that's a good in point. a way yeah which is his job who runs um, who runs the ship that's an interesting factor of this of this book. It's different than a lot of other ones. They're told these are their jobs, but it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly to them and to us, the reader, that the AI system is 100% in control. They have actually no ability to influence what the ship does really at all. Yeah. One of the interesting things to me about this book is the point it makes about AI being um, a tool rather than a personality, uh, like, a, like an extension of humanity. Um, and I think that's something that's often elided uh, when we have AI focused science fiction. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the things that this book is grappling at is something that's very familiar, especially in military science fiction. And that is what is the reason for the war? Um, so in that sense, this book um, is part of a long tradition. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about comparable books, but I, I was thinking about Forever War, Starship Troopers, Ender's Game, all of these books where we get to know um, soldiers who are completely alienated from the cause that they're fighting for and, you know, really wondering, why am I even here? Who am I fighting for? What's the end game? Because it's the same thing here, too. You know, in, in Forever War, the characters there don't know what is the end game. We've all lost sight of what is the goal here. And that is um, very much present here as well. Um, and we have some scenes with the captain where she, before she's deployed on this mission, she's talking about things that have happened in the past and where are we going with this? And she, she really becomes very disillusioned, disillusioned and realizes, I don't know why we're doing any of this. So it was interesting to me that she ultimately ended up deciding to go on this mission at all, because there's just this constant overarching question of why are we here and what's the point of all of this? Yep. Big time. Um, the, 
other, I think, big thing here, the other like big theme to talk about is there's like multiple layers of identity. Like we particularly see this with Beanfield. Like she feels like she's one person. And then she has this other like on screen persona that like her followers see from her whatever TikToks that she sends back to Earth. Um, <laughs> and then there's like, you know, who you are in respect to the people you know. Like what do they think of you as? Um, and yeah, it's just like some interesting layering and, and sort of, I don't know. Science fiction is often so concerned with things in the very far future. It like doesn't bother to comment about stuff we that's going on right now. But this book is very much about like how is social media different than than real life and how much of what happens is like just because of social media sort of a thing. Um, There's a conversation between Beanfield and Gilly that I found really interesting where she starts talking about the ship as possibly its own identity. And Gilly is just almost appalled by that, you know, being scientific and a programmer and having worked on the AI, he just is like, what are you talking about? And he um, describes it to her as he says, the ship is not alive, but to the extent that it even is, it is not aware of us. And he makes the analogy that the people are like or to the ship are like our red blood cells are to us. You know, they're, they're part of us, they're within us, but we're not aware of them. We don't communicate with them. And she has this funny kind of cute moment where she thinks to herself, she may not know her red blood cells, but she wishes them well. So it was an interesting <laughs> conversation about who or what we are in relationship to other consciousnesses. Yeah. And other, like even down to the cellular level. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and I had, I'd skipped ahead a little bit on this, but there, there's also, you know, Speaking of the AI, um, another interesting factor of it in this book is I think a lot of science fiction books, we get uh, pilots, right? We get people who are manning the ships. Um, and I think that it's authors do that because it's easy. It's high stakes. It's dramatic. Um, but it seems so unrealistic to me that a uh, ship that's doing like this complex, futuristic, you know, almost light speed travel or faster than light travel, whatever, whatever book it is. Um, and, and doing combat with other ships, uh, is not just driven by a computing system. Like it is in uh defensive forever war. Uh, that's one of the only times I've, I've seen it otherwise. And that was very early on is the ship is controlling everything, um, for them. But I found that really uh, satisfying about Providence that the, the ship is, they're really just there to kind of like send their social media feeds back to earth, the crew, not really do anything on the ship. Um, although Brent, Brent disagrees. <laughs> yeah. It made me crazy. Even an old car, like when you push on the gas, there are computers that are controlling what actually happens inside the engine. Right. But that doesn't mean the person isn't driving the car. This book took it like way beyond where it's like, yes, of course there should be computer systems, but the humans have like no input and the, they designed this thing with, if they're going to give the computer system total control, it doesn't have to like, it sends no information out. It's just like a black box that they are like, yeah, that's fine. We're just going to like make this insane death machine. And then like, <laughs> it's just going to, it's just out there. Um, so yeah, it made me a little, it made me a little nuts. When we were talking about, uh, you know, what brings you in and out of a story in the hard sci-fi, soft sci-fi shorty a couple weeks ago, um, you know, anything that's close to your field can sometimes pull you out in a sci-fi area. Yeah, so you're in, as a software you know person, about this AI, me. So, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So because to me, it seemed totally like within the, the bounds of the novel. Yeah, for sure. I suspended my disbelief. <laughs> Either way, moving on to like the, the world and the universe of the novel. Um, Laura, you had an interesting thought about the, the population. I was trying to figure out when this was because it feels to me um, like these are people that I could know. You know, when I first was thinking about it, I thought this is, you know, the the technology, of course, is incredible. But in terms of the people, the social media, the way people interact with each other, I thought, you know, 100 years in the future, maybe. And I'd read some reviews that speculated that maybe it was 50 to 100 years in the future. But with a population of 28 billion humans, um, that really gave me pause and made me curious about when this was supposed to be. That's fair. I guess why that didn't bother me as much is because we're kind of where we're at is kind of inside the spaceship the Mm -hmm. whole time, almost, right? Like, that's where most of it takes place. Yeah, it is. It was just a couple of little details that jumped out at me, and I thought, 28 billion, and I was like, 
<laughs> when can we ever get there? And uh, the answer seems to be like, probably never. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Sweet. So what about the, so we often talk about like cringe factor, um, particularly a problem in old books happens pretty much in every old book. But in this case, we have a few even in a modern book, unfortunately, although they're not as bad as some old stuff. But anyway, let's get into it. What do we got that's cringy here? Yeah, really just the the answer is Anders. Um, there were a couple of things that leapt out at me, and I, I hope you all don't mind if I answer this part. Um, <laughs> this Hit is it. kind of my Please. bread and butter. We have a whole segment this about your this. your wheelhouse on, for sure. Yeah, yeah, on our <laughs> show. Um, we have our misogynist moment is what we call it on, on our show. Um, so an early red flag was all of our human characters are getting made up for uh, TV interviews. And Anders says he feels like a painted whore, which is such a funny thing to say. Like, it feels very dated. If somebody said that now, it, it feels like something your, you know, drunk grandpa would say. And <laughs> then it, uh, you know, for it to be however many, maybe centuries in the future for somebody to say that was just very strange. Um, and, you know, I, I always take exception to the idea of using the idea of sex work or terms associated with sex work as derogatory. And obviously that's what's happening here. So it just kind of surprised me and was a little bit of an early red flag. And then I kind of forgot about it. Um, and then we get further into the book and I think we're in our first Anders chapter. So we're probably at about the midpoint of the book. And, um, there is a point where I know you keep your show clean, so I won't quote the book verbatim, but uh, <laughs> Anders makes a very lewd comment to Jackson, who is the ship's captain, um, about what he would be more than happy to do with her. And it's, you know, he then <laughs> is mystified that she's angry about that. And so for me, it was shocking to read a book published in 2022 with a character like that, not because I think that people wouldn't be like that, but I think that people would and do no better than that. This is a person in his 20s. He's at work. He's made a lewd comment and a demeaning comment to his boss. And I'm not saying someone wouldn't do that, but the fact that he was then confused by her reaction, right. <laughs> right. I was just incredulous. I thought – this guy wouldn't be a guy who has this job, you know? And I mean, we can talk all day about why these people were selected for this particular role, but it was just very silly to me. Um, and, and it was kind of disappointing. And it was also surprising to me that Jackson would have tolerated that was just mad about it. And that was it. Like she's the captain. I mean, she can throw him in the brig. She can shoot him with her little air gun, which apparently it really sucks to get shot with her little air gun. Um, right. Cause she does all that stuff her later. And gun. so I was puzzled that the character would do that. And I was puzzled that she would tolerate that. Yeah. That, and that's a good like microcosmal example of, and there's just some weird stuff with Anders. It's generally kind of like a, I'm the macho character mm -hmm. type thing. And we and, get some background on him. He's very much got the hurt people, hurt people thing going on. Um, so we get some background that I think works to make him a more sympathetic character, but I remain mm -hmm. very confused reading this type of characterization in a book from 2020. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's take in the other direction, X factor stuff that makes this book unique. Um, there's the, I mean, the whole idea of like the war as a theatrical production that's designed to like make more weapons, which is like very clear in the first half of the book. And we'll talk more about in the post spoiler section. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's certainly something interesting and novel. And it was like a modern take on like an anti industrial, you know, military industrial complex, uh, um, story. Um, so that felt, that felt somewhat novel and refreshing. Yeah. What, what about you, Laurie? What was so your, so there was a sort of an implied relationship, maybe a kind of a friendship developing between Beanfield and the ship, which is why I've continued to say human characters. Um, for a lot of the book, um, it seems to be implied, and it's not entirely clear if it is in Beanfield's head or if the ship actually is responsive and aware of her. Um, and I thought that that was neat because we've seen a lot of books, I think, where there is a, a sentient ship. Um, it has a relationship with its passengers or with its crew, especially. Um, I thought of Ancillary Justice, which I love. Mm -hmm. I love that trilogy. Um, and I really enjoy the the um, the ships and the ship later personified. I think that is really interesting. 
Um, but, you know, that's very much obvious. The ship is having conversations with people. They're talking to it. It has a name. So we know what's going on there. We understand that dynamic. This I thought was neat because uh, we don't know if Beanfield is imagining it or if it's real. And we have to kind of look at some clues to figure out what might or might not be going on there. And that felt um, that felt like something I hadn't really seen before. Yeah. Totally. That was an interesting, like new kind of interaction. Um, and I, and I just, I mean, that kind of leads to what I was going to say, which is, um, I love any book, um, that decentralizes humans, um, in the universal, on the universal scale that takes us and, and to, you know, to my personal beliefs, um, just align with that, that idea where, where, uh, we admit that, um, we're not, we're not the center of the universe. We're not the purpose. There's other stuff out there. Um, and it doesn't care about us. We're our own thing. Um, and I thought this was a great, um, novel for exploring that idea. Um, so with that said, let's do some similar book recommendations. What should people read if they like Providence or what are some good guideposts that they might like Providence? Uh, Lori, why don't you start? So the book I kept thinking about when I was reading this was Forever War. Um, the theme of alienation between the soldiers and the cause of the war is very much front and center in the Forever War, and I think it is front and center here. Um, in this book, it's acknowledged from day one that we kind of know that we're here for show. The crew is here for show. And in the Forever War, I think it takes a little bit longer for our characters to see that and become very divorced from the cause that they're fighting and dying for, and then to get to a point where they genuinely have no no idea what it is. And in this book, I think um, there's a little bit more of an acknowledgement that they themselves are not particularly instrumental in it, um, but they still believe that they are participating in a fight for humanity. And then throughout the book that does unravel. And so in that sense, I think this is, this book is part of that tradition. So I think people who enjoyed this may also enjoy the forever war. Yeah. I think that's a great pick. Uh, I also had that on my list before we chatted. Um, I also picked um, Blind Sight. Brent and I both picked Blind Sight um, by uh, Peter Watts, which we've done an episode on recently. And I think it's just a great um, parallel in terms of the alien life um, and the exploration of like what types of life might be out there um, and what types of consciousness might be out there, what, what consciousness could potentially be. Really interesting speculative fiction um, about that in both Providence and Blind Sight. For sure. And then I'm going to do uh, another Max Berry book, Lexicon, that I actually like a lot more than this one. I really like Lexicon. Um, it's a super <laughs> page turner um, set in like the modern day, but it's about these crazy like words of power and they're trying to like unearth these like ancient magic spells. It's very cool. It's very cool. It's very fun um, and super propulsive. Uh, it feels, it's like more like the, back half of this book, which we should talk about right now, post-spoiler section. Back half of Providence. In, all right, so we're about to do the sp uh, spoilers, so uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for joining us, Lori, for those of you who are leaving before post-spoilers, but otherwise, um, we will start those in three, two, one. Brent, what happens to the rest of the book? Okay, so uh, at one point... Gilly is inside like the ship's CPU room and the ship is building a wall to wall him inside. It's going to trap him in there. He's going to die. So to save him, they turn off the AI, which basically turns the ship off. Um, they get Gilly out of there, but the salamanders attack at just that moment, basically. And so they're firing all these crazy, the aliens like physically fire these like they call, they're like quark glue on whatever, but they're like mini black holes, basically that like tear stuff apart. That's close to them. <laughs> um, and so they're firing those all through the ship. They're totally destroying it. They have to bail out. They get on an escape pod, um, and blast off. And there's a nearby planet. They crash land and down on the planet, they find their way to this uh, salamander hive. It's like a giant volcano. That's like spewing flying salamanders constantly into the air. And they're working their way deeper and deeper into the hive. Along the way, they're dying one at a time. Extremely tragic. Um, and in the end, they get down to this big pool of liquid with these like hatchlings in it. And they discover that the salamander, there is like a, a queen that's producing all these salamanders, but it's like not a sentient thing. It's just this like pool of goop. And this whole planet they're on is the organism. It's like a pool of goop that makes soldiers. Um, 
And so there's like no reasoning with the salamanders. They're just like death machines that are going to try to destroy humanity and take over everything. Um, Beanfield is the sole survivor. She's up on the surface. She gets all this intel from Gilly. He was like down inside the hive and he got captured and he was you know, taking all these recordings. Anyway, he sends it all to her so she knows what happened. Then the ship shows back up. It turns out it repaired itself, um, picks her up, shows that it maybe actually does care about her a little bit, blows the whole salamander hive up, and the book ends. Okay, Woo. we made it. Yeah, and we it won. ends with it. Yeah. yeah, that's literally the last we, we phrase in the book, right? We won. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about that we won, Lori? I don't really know what to do with that. Um, <laughs> I, you know, throughout the whole book, the the book and the characters have kind of been telling us that the war is self-perpetuating. The real war, as they say, the real war is at home. The real war is the theater and keeping the public invested and willing to fund the creation of more and more of these warships. Um, so if we've won, then presumably all of that is over and public support for an ongoing war would be over. And if the point was to continue creating these ships, then I don't know what it means if we won. Like, did did we actually win because that was the primary um, hive for the salamanders and the ship blew it up? And so we actually literally did win and we can stop all of this. But what I feel like I learned from the book was that the incentive was really to keep this going to continue production of these ships. And I have like a little conspiracy theory in mind that the AI are running the companies and the AI are building the ships that are run by the AI. So to my mind, the AI is kind of controlling things. So I would think that it would be invested in the continuation of the war so it can keep replicating itself in these very powerful ships. I don't know. I didn't know what to do with the we won at the end. I, I think, yeah, I, I agree. And I think that I think it could just mean a lot of things, which I guess some could argue is not great writing unless it means interesting things to you, but I, I think it meant partially um because I, I I agree that your AI continuation is compelling. I also agree I also think that the We One feels a little bit sarcastic by Barry saying like you know, we we won, yay. Um and then it and there's an element of that. And then also the other thing it said to me was that the most important part or one of the most important themes in the novel is expressing that we, uh, as humans, there's no real like foundational purpose or reason for being, and that we have to make our own purposes and stories. Um, and I, th I found that with a lot of, uh, you know, what happens with the characters at the end, um, they all, they all die trying to save Gilly in pretty fruitless way. It doesn't matter what they do because the ship ultimately just blows up the planet and it's the only thing that has the power to blow up the planet. But the the humans were there to tell a story and um, they they made their own stories of, of self-sacrifice at the end um, and made their own, thus made their own reasons for being. And so like the We One is also kind of like our false ending. It's the story that humanity was telling itself about fighting the salamanders like that's that narrative's wrapped up that narrative loops wrapped up so i th i guess it, you know it could be an interesting point or it could be a completely weird ending line depending on how you look at it i think it just i think it's just how how the rest of the novel hits you yeah um, I think I'm on the lorry the, the lorry half of the spectrum with this one like the first half of the book felt like a like you know, it was like this, you know, the characters sort of quickly realize they're the social media stars and the whole point is to keep making these spaceships. I, and I was thinking the same thing, like, OK, there's got to be like a bigger twist. There's a deeper level of them getting manipulated by whatever the AI or some people on Earth who want to perpetuate the war or whatever. But then instead, the second half of the novel kind of went like in a blind sight direction where it was like, oh, actually, these aliens like have no reasoning they are going to try to destroy and take over everything. They're just like self-replicating DNA that seeks to take over. And so we did need to destroy them and it was an existential threat. And so it almost, it was like, it was, those are both sort of interesting, potentially interesting books, but it just felt like I read like half of one book and then I was waiting for the twist that would make that book interesting, but there wasn't one. Instead, we got this other twist that I've read in other books, but it just like didn't feel as well done or in this. It was like just two, two different books stitched together. Um, so yeah, I, maybe it's yeah. like a, maybe it's like, like a Jimmy eat world lyric or something. Like it can either be the most meaningful lyric of all time. If you apply your own meaning to it, or you can be like, that doesn't mean anything. 
<laughs> What's the deal with that? <laughs> Maybe it was just um, entertainment. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which, yeah. I, you know, I thought it was entertaining. I think some of you all out there will like it. Um, let's do a one one last thing, one last of the bigger things. What did you all think about the primordial soup as the alien at the end? I liked it. I liked the I uh I liked this idea that like there's this sort of like theme they mentioned a few times throughout that like oh this struggle is actually like just between our DNA and their DNA like we as individuals don't matter this is just about like the survival of the species kind of a thing and then you get to yeah. the end and it makes it very clear that like actually that's all it ever was for the salamanders because they are like non sentient beings who are made by 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 mad soup um, and so yes that's interesting <laughs> but it didn't. Um, yeah, again, that feels like an interesting point, but it just felt like an interesting point in like a different book. Uh, it just felt strange in this one to me. So I liked, I like that idea, but it's, it just felt, I had like some cognitive dissonance with it. I didn't have super strong feelings about the soup itself. I'm fine with it. I have nothing against it. Pro soup. Um, I, yeah, the soup is fine. Um, <laughs> three stars, but, uh, I, I am ultimately a little bit disappointed by a monster that is just a monster. Um, and I hear you, Cody, on the decentralizing humanity as like our frame of reference for things. You know, this is something that is totally different from us, but it um, it's not something that we have no understanding of because we can just look at it and call it a monster or call it like a, a dumb animal kind of. So that was like a little bit disappointing to me that the bad guy did turn out to just be like a, a monster, you know, a non-sentient monster with like – no purpose or no awareness. And I, I don't know, that just felt a little flat to me. Um, and I almost thought like, I'd like to see a sequel where they are truly alien and they are sentient in some different way from us or something that we can't connect with. We can't communicate with. And that was the thing that reminded me of Ender's game. They're just always looking for good seasoning. If the soup is just out there trying to find <laughs> enough time to season its entire planet full of soup. Give me a planet salt. <laughs> so I didn't hate the soup, but I'm a little like disappointed by the idea of um, them just kind of as dumb monsters. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, uh, weirdly, I guess, I guess I totally agree with your point because I felt like uh, that was the same thing. However, I just like, I liked it. I kind of liked, maybe it's just because we read so much stuff that's, um, that's, uh, you know, objectively a little more thought provoking, like Ender's Game mm -hmm. about, you know, what, what is empathy? Um, and it, I, I haven't read as much stuff recently. That's just like, it's a monster. <laughs> that's totally it. true. It's dangerous. And so I actually kind of liked it just felt kind of refreshing to me, um, in terms of what, what I've been reading. Um, so I, so it could be a perspective thing, but I think we don't, we'd all agree that, yeah, I mean, the point is that it's just a mindless, um, virus basically meant to meant to kill us um pumping out salamanders <laughs> um well yeah i mean i think that's that's all about providence um Lori, thank you so much for joining us uh it was really fun having you on thanks for Brought having me up. this is great yeah it was awesome yeah next time we see you in person let's um let's get some soup and take our revenge yes absolutely <laughs> and season the soup yes yes <laughs> All right. I'll see y'all later and Thanks. see you later, Lori. Bye. Bye.